I, I think the single most important part is your social network and your uh, personal connections and how they provide the strength to recover. Um, every time someone visited me, you know, uh, you know it was, I think they felt it didn't make a difference, but in, in reality, each, each visit and each, uh, when someone reached out and said they cared, that actually encouraged me to keep working and keep advancing. Because when, when you're deep down in the hole, so to speak, it's really hard to dig out. And sometimes you say, well, does it really matter? And, and I can tell you when friends are encouraging you, when family is encouraging you, you uh, are more motivated. And I think that's the most important um, lesson I, I, I've taken away from this. As I'll mention at the beginning of the talk, what my vascular surgeons did is they were very understanding and they were very cautious in the way they relayed the information to me. What happened is when they did the angiogram, they realized that there was no repairing my vessels in my leg. And they knew that meant amputation, but they wouldn't even use the word amputation at first. They just presented the data to me and to my wife, Kathy, and obviously I knew what that meant. They didn't have to tell me. And what happened is they then didn't say, well, you need an amputation right away. They told me, well, you know, it's a big decision to lose your leg. And why don't you go home and see if you can tolerate um, the the deficient vascular supply that you have. Maybe you can do it, and, and it's important for you to decide when is the right time. And I, you know, I had such terrible pain, I, I lasted a week and a half, and I decided that this was not going to work. And furthermore, because I'm an infectious disease specialist, I had seen many diabetics with vascular insufficiency who had suffered recurrent infections uh, because of that vascular insufficiency. And I had watched them try to keep their leg for months and months and be hospitalized over and over again. And sometimes even get uh, bacteria in their blood, bacteremia, and have their life threatened trying to keep their limbs. So I had realized watching other patients that this would be an unwise choice and that I might as well get move on with the program and accept what had happened and deal with it in the most efficient and effective way I could. And, but the surgeons, let me make that decision. They did not push me at all. And the other thing I can tell you that happened is I really wanted a below the knee amputation because obviously if you have your knee you can function far better than without a knee. And I think they knew that it probably wouldn't work because the vascular supply um, in the uh, right beneath my knee was quite bad. But they gave it a try and they did it below the knee and within 10 days it became necrotic, you know, the tissue started to die. And as soon as they saw that, obviously we knew that I couldn't leave that on because you can get serious infections and, and you risk death leaving a limb on like that. So at that point, boy, was I anxious to get the above the knee amputation. And, and I felt terrible. I just felt very, very sick. And um, they were extremely empathetic. They felt just terrible that the below the knee had not worked. And then within, uh, I had to wait over a weekend, which was the longest weekend, I think, of my life. But uh, then on Tuesday, uh, Friday, they realized it was necrotic. Tuesday, they did the surgery, and, and I felt actually relieved to have above the knee amputation just by the way they let me make the decisions. So I think the lesson I, I would take away for um, physicians is to present the data and allow the patient to come to the conclusions and decisions. And each patient, I think, will have a different time frame. Because I had had past experience, I was able to come to that decision quite quickly. But others may take longer, and it's their choice, and they have to deal with it, and they have to cope with uh, this terrible loss. Oh, I definitely wasn't prepared 
as, as I'll talk, uh, I thought I had a calf pole for a month. And then when my foot turned white, I knew that it wasn't a calf pole. But um, because I've always been extremely physically active, I mean, since uh, age two, my parents tell me that I ran around at five times the rate of any child they saw and broke everything in the house. And um, I actually, in college, I actually earned three varsity letters in three different sports. Not that I needed three varsity letters, but I just, if I didn't do a sport, I just felt uh, bored. I had, I had to have that physical activity. So athletics, physical activity, physical prowess, whatever, was a major, is a major part of my identity. So the loss of a leg was really big. And um, it, it really made me question, you know, would my life be worth it anymore? And, and that was a, a very stark reality, particularly in the early phases, and particularly at a time when I had a lot of pain initially, too. So the combination of pain and, and not having a leg and the reaction of many of my friends uh, to see me, of all people, having lost a leg, they just couldn't even believe it, uh, many. But most people who knew me realized based on my previous athletic career, that I would uh, rise to the occasion, that I would overcome um, what happened. But it was nice to ha have them tell me that, even though I got tired of it. I must tell you about it. Oh, you're, you're going to be OK. You've handled all this stuff. I said, oh, Lord. If I hear that one more time, I'm going to scream. But even though I sort of was slightly annoyed by it, actually, and when I think back, I was really uh, encouraged by that, and I think it did help me, because everybody was looking at me, well, Fred, you got to do it. We expect you to do it. And, and I think others' expectations do um, encourage you to rise to a higher level. I, I didn't feel I ne met, needed a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist. Um, my approach to life is um, once, I, once the reality is there, uh, accept it and deal with it and move on. And sitting around thinking about it and perseverating and ruminating about it, just, you know, I've never done that in my life and I just won't go there. So uh, I think my wife, Kathy, had a much harder time actually with the loss of my leg than I did. And we actually did go to some counseling, um, mainly to help her. And the psychologist, when, as I explained it to her, realized that I, I really was able to cope with this for whatever reason. Just that it's just the way I've always dealt with life. So, um, and it did help Kathy to adjust. She was extremely angry and, and just could not believe it. I mean, she just could not accept that I didn't have my leg took her longer to accept what had happened to me than it took me to accept it. And I think that uh, is quite common uh, because obviously this affected her life probably more or as much as it affected mine because, you know, she had to push me around. She had to, uh, in the wheelchair, she had to get everything for me. She had to change the dressings. She had to get up in the middle of the night when I needed help. Um, so, and I was always the one that did everything, you know, as the man, you know, not everything, but the sort of manly chores. And now I couldn't do any of those anymore. I couldn't take the I couldn't take the trash out, the garbage out anymore. She had to wheel it out, you know, those kinds of things, and and it drastically affected her life for about a year. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I knew what was going on. I, I did not know exactly what to expect as far as the rate of recovery or how prosthesis would work, how much I would be able to function. Um, those questions were, uh, I was very concerned about the answers to those questions. In fact, I looked at a number of books and they were atrocious. I, I could not stand the books on amputation, every one of them. Uh, ignored the first six months of recovery and then went right to how they succeeded in running a triathlon or Ironman or some incredible feat biking, you know, X number of miles. And I'm telling you, when you're struggling to just live each day, 
these kind of books are actually disheartening. I think they have the a reverse effect that they're intended. And actually, as a consequence of that, I'm actually working on a book to describe the first six months uh, of recovery. Um, what happens in uh, drug addiction is your brain um, is, is, is just not working properly and, and um, as you withdraw from drugs you feel depressed, you feel down, you are in a deep hole. And the very, I, I, I truly believe that all of the methods for uh, encouraging resilience will work virtually in any stressful situation loss of a leg, uh, a loss of, of joy in life. And, and I think that's what um, most people who are trying to get off drugs lose their joy in life. And, and unfortunately, their joy in life were the drugs. And now they have a very flat and they feel very, just, they have a lot of despair. And, and believe me, at the beginning, I felt that same despair and that same, you know, wow, life stinks. Life is not good, and, and am I ever going to have a good life? And, and uh, the message is, with the support of friends, uh, with uh, certain strategies, with a certain degree of optimism, I think you've got to be optimistic or learn to be optimistic. Uh, and I, I do think physical activity and, and, and sports are very helpful in, in, in improving your outlook and actually improving your feeling about life. So I think all these strategies, the same strategies that have worked for me with my leg can work in recovering from 